Hello, Minnesota. Welcome to the Tony Hernandez Show. I'm your host, Tony Hernandez. Today's Saturday, April 26th. It's a beautiful day here in the Twin Cities. Uh, the Congressional District 4 Convention uh, was this morning. Congratulations to Sharna Walgren. She got the Republican endorsement. Uh, she will be running against Congresswoman Betty McCollum in the 2014 elections. We'll be following that race closely and keeping you updated on everything. Uh, must forgive me if I sound a, a little hoarse right now. I'm just getting over a cold or allergies or something for the last uh, week and a half. My right side of my head just feels like it's been pounding and I've been sniffling and coughing. And, and actually today is the, the first day where I felt that, that ray of sunshine or that light from the darkness uh, come upon. So I'm feeling a little better today. Uh, we have a great show. We're going to be talking about a very important uh, issue, and that's the issue of the proposed national popular vote. I'm going to bring, be bringing on Reed Oynes, and we're going to be talking more about that. Uh, but first, I wanted to uh, explain a little more about what the national popular vote movement is. And Dallas, if you could pull up uh, the website here, it's nationalpopularvote.com. And it says the national popular vote bill would guarantee the presidency to the candidate who receives the most popular votes in the entire United States. The bill preserves the Electoral College while ensuring that every vote in every state will matter in every presidential election. It goes on to say the national popular vote law has been enacted by 11 jurisdictions possessing 165 electoral votes, 61% of the 270 electoral votes needed to activate it. And you can see the states uh, that have passed it, Rhode Island, Vermont, Maryland, Washington, Illinois, uh, New Jersey, Washington, D.C., Massachusetts, California, and uh, Hawaii. And, uh, you know, just recently, some of these states, I think Oklahoma just passed it, and others. And uh, so with that, I'm going to bring on our guest, Reed Oynes. Welcome to the Tony Hernandez Show. Thank you. It's great to have you here. Thank you. And uh, so we're talking about the, the national popular vote. A uh, number of states have already passed this into their uh, respective legislations. And essentially what it would do is, is change the system that we have right now, which is the electoral a college system, which is was de designed by the founders mm -hmm. of the United States, and changing it to uh, what they call the national popular vote, uh, which ultimately would decide presidential elections uh, just strictly based on the number of votes uh, for one side versus versus the other. Is that a, a fair characterization yes, of it? Yes, that's correct. And before we get into you know the differences and you know why this is a good or a bad thing. Um, I wanted to talk to you and, and uh, help teach our audience a little bit more about the system that we have in place right now, uh, the Electoral College, like what is it uh, in the history as well. So Okay. Um, well, basically, we'll start out just explaining what it is. Um, as the election takes place on the first uh, Tuesday in November, uh, every four years for the president, um, the citizens of each state will elect, or what they're going to do is vote for a slate of electors. And the slate of electors is, is decided by the state itself. And in our case, um, we have uh, electors that are picked from the Republican Party, from the Democratic Party, and from the Independence Party. Other um, slates of electors can be added, but they have to be petitioned to be added. Um, when a candidate wins that election, whichever slate, like in the case this last election, Obama won our state. Um, in that case, then his slate was the one that was elected by the people. And those votes then get put into the big pile um, and they go through another process, signing a bunch of documents and, and whatever to uh, make it legal. And um, then they tally up to the 270. And if he gets that, he wins. Um, so how many how many electoral mm -hmm. votes are there nationwide right now? Nationwide, um, there's 500. And, well, let's see. 
538, okay. because there's three in the District of Columbia, 435 in the House, and 100 in the Senate. Okay. Um, you need 270 to win. Um, the, the, I guess the way this was brought about by the Founding Fathers, we can go back and talk about that now, is, the, is what they did is they, they, didn't, they didn't like the Articles of Confederation, so they got together to basically amend that. But when they started working on it to amend it, they decided oh, we're just going to come up with a whole new document. And it was um, about three and a half months that they debated on how the document was going to be put in place um, and who was going to be able to elect, in our case, for the House of Representatives, who was going to elect the Senate, who was going to elect the President. They had many different scenarios, and basically there's a lot of argument in regards to both sides, which one was better or not better. Um, there was um, basically, I'm just going to briefly mention, there was four different plans that came out. The first two plans were introduced on, on the, basically the first day was the Virginia plan, and that was a bicameral plan, and uh, it, was a, it was a plan that had the Senate uh, or the House was elected, the House members at that time, they called it a national legislature. They were selected by the state legislature. That's what their plan was. And then they wanted to have, um, the Senate was elected in another means. And the president was going to be elected, um, at that point was going to be elected by the national legislature, which was the House and the Senate. Um, there was a, a Pinckney plan that really never took off. It was real similar. Um, there was a, another plan, a New Jersey plan, and that came uh, about a month later, and, or two to three weeks later, and that one was brought out where that plan um, was a plan that was more for the small states, so the small states had more say in the, in the whole system. Um, and the last plan was the Hamilton plan, which basically um, was a plan that said, we want our president and the Senate to be lifelong members of those bodies. So the only way you could remove them is either they decided not to stay in, um, they did something illegal, or you know there was something to impeach them out of the out of the service of the, their job that they had. Um, over that, I think it's three and a half month period. Um, they, it, it, if you read the Madison notes, it ebbed and flowed. Were the most most the effort put on selecting the president um, was based on national legislature or state legislature. Um, they never really resolved what they wanted to do. Um, there was a committee that, that uh, was made up um, probably about August, I think it was, no, July, I believe it was, and it was called the Committee of Detail. And they basically were tasked to put all this information together and to drop the proposals and submit it. And when they, the last proposal they submitted was one that had the people electing electors and the state legislature deciding who those electors are. Mm -hmm. Which, if you read the notes, it's really quite funny. I mean, you can see things falling into pattern and how they were going to get there. But when it was getting close, and you know, September 17th was the date they signed it, and they hadn't resolved it at that point. You, you kind of wondered how they really came about it. But it was a committee of a few people, and they designed the system uh, according to all the other input, mm -hmm. and the people went with it. And uh, question, did they ever ponder the idea of selecting the president from a national popular vote at the time not of really. the founding? Not was really. That even a, a um, there was, why not? There was, well, there was, uh, yeah, that's a really good point. Um, there, was, there was a number, um, a couple of proponents for it. One was, um, I think it was James Wilson, James Madison. Um, they both liked the idea of popular vote. Um, Madison didn't say a lot about it till the end. Um, but his position was, if it was going to be a popular vote, you could, and, and part of the reason he went that way is because the national uh, legislature and the state legislature, they couldn't resolve those two items. So he figured the best way to do it, because of all the different issues with those two components, um, they, they thought there would be fraud in there, there would be, if the national legislature, if the president was selected by that component, that the, um, there would be, where he'd be, kind of be, be uh, he had to, oh, I can't think of the word right now, but he's, 
um, they had one up on him. In other words, if they wanted him to do something because he was given that position. In other words, the next election he could come back and say, you know, we're not going to elect you because you didn't do what we wanted you mm -hmm. to do. So um, there's that. There's a possibility of fraud. There's a possibility of uh, developing a cabal in mm -hmm. the national legislature that could basically take over the whole system and, and um, you know, we could have all kinds of issues, which we have now already anyway. So they ultimately then decided on the idea of the Electoral College and was it determined at that time how they would uh, calculate how many votes each state or yeah. future state would yes. get? What yeah. did they use for that? Um, well, that they, they basically put it in, in the system that um, the the last proposal that was written up was written up by the committee and that proposal stated something as, I'm going to paraphrase it, but the, the people would select the, the, or vote for the electors that was selected by the um, national or the state legislature. So that being the case, um, they also allotted, now how many do you get? Well, they had debated the whole issue um, for the populace in the House, and, and actually it was the, the lower branch, but it later became the House of Representatives. And even in that case, they debated long and hard, did they want the people to vote for those individuals as their representatives? And they finally came about that they said, look, we have to have the people involved somehow. That's a good one because in, the, in that position, those representatives now should be closer to the people and the people should really understand who that person is. And so when they go to elect them, they'll know who they're electing. Um, the, um, the point with um, the actual, the people involved, it was the point that he thought, Madison felt that possibly, since we're having issues with, um, you know, uh, the national legislature or the state legislature, the different criticisms about it. Um, one, I mean, one of the points he had too was, we're criticizing everything. So it doesn't matter what we're going to put up, we're going to criticize it. So why don't we look at possibly the populist vote? And in not so much the populist vote as having the populist vote or the people voting for um, electors or a slate of electors. And then um, those, that slate would be suggested by the, the states. Hmm. And they came up with the, that whole system as they worked on it. Um, they came up with... Um, they wanted equal representation in the Senate, so that's where they came up with the two. I mean, there's a long debate about that. Um, and then there was the uh, populish, population or the populist um, division of the larger states having more votes than the smaller states, so it was combined together. And the idea of combining it was it kind of gave the smaller states a little more weight so you wouldn't have the larger states basically dictating who would be the president mm -hmm. uh, at any given time. Well, let's get into uh, the, the national popular vote movement. I, I pointed out sure. at, at the beginning, read what the proponents of the national popular vote are saying. It uh, looks like a number of states have already passed this in the legislation and they're inching their way up to that 270 mm -hmm. uh, threshold they, they need. And, and they're touting that it has bipartisan support. Uh, even in our own state, Dallas, if you can uh, pop up that list here, uh, we have a, a list of uh, Minnesota legislators from both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party uh, who are supporters of the national popular vote. You can see on the congressional side of uh, the Congressional District 6 candidate, uh, Tom Emmer, Republican endorsed, is supporting it. Uh, Congresswoman Betty McCollum, who is uh, the incumbent right here in the 4th District where our show is broadcasting out of, uh, she supports it. If you look on the, uh, the House side, uh, Jim Abler running for U.S. Senate, he supports it. Uh, Representative uh, Fitzsimmons, although he no longer earned the Republican endorsement, uh, he did uh, support, or he does support uh, the national popular vote. Graffalo, Hamilton, Howe, Kelly, Mac, McDonald, McNamara, Sanders. Uh, it looks like a lot of uh, supporters. Uh, Governor candidate, Representative Zellers, uh, he's, he's uh, in support of this, and, and then a number of, of Democrats, uh, including, and then on the Senate side, it looks like Senator Karen Housley, supports it, and also Senator Brandon Peterson. So <clears throat> based off of uh, this data, read, it looks like uh, a lot of Minnesota legislators, both Republicans and, and Democrats, uh, are supporting it. Some bigger names, as, as I stated, Tom Emmer is a, is a supporter of it as well. Uh, why do you think there's so much uh, bipartisan support for 
national popular vote? Uh, well, I, I think uh, one main reason is I think there's a lot of people that don't understand the Electoral College and what the purpose is. Um, if, if um, you know, if we can put up a chart real quick, I can do this, that one with a map. Sure. This is, this is an example um, how the Electoral College really works. Um, it, it, it will give you a good feel um, in regards to the weight of um, the whole system and also give you an idea of the national popular vote and how that will affect it. So we're looking at here then some red states and, red and states blue would be, states. Red and states are, um, in this case, the last election they were Republican voting mm -hmm. where, the, where the Republican candidate won. The blue state was the, um, the Democrat candidate won. Okay. Uh, in the case of California, uh, California has uh, 13 million voters. And um, they had a um, difference of three, about three million people voting more for uh, President Obama than they did for Romney. Um, and so if we look at that and we go back and, and try to match up the number of votes that uh, in the case that California had over the Republican candidate, it would take 14 states and of those 14 states, that would be elect uh, 78 electoral votes. And um, it, you can just kind of weigh it. You can see it takes a lot more to counter, in this case, counter 3 million votes. And if you look at it, the 14 red states have just a little under 3 million. So they still wouldn't have won. So if you just look at this as that's the country, that's who's selecting the president, um, one state can dictate the whole thing. Um, and that's not the only problem we have. We have New York. Um, we also have, um, well, Texas. You can look in Texas, isn't, you know, if you're conservative, isn't a problem. But the fact is, someday it may be a, a, a blue state. Um, they're changing, these states are changing all the time. Um, but if you look at, there's other scenarios too we can come up with um, really quickly. Um, the fact is, you have a situation like New York they had one million, uh, almost two million people voting more for President Obama than they had for um, Romney. And that's 29 electoral votes. In order to come up with the 29 electoral votes, and I really couldn't make it match, I was trying to match it on the eastern mm -hmm. um, side of the, st the states there, uh, I came up with Tennessee, Kentucky, and Indiana. And they amounted to one million, about 1,200,000 votes, and that was 30 electoral votes. And you can still see how New York still controls that situation. Mm -hmm. This is why the Electoral College, or not the college, but the Electoral Vote was created, later known as Electoral College, was created. It was to make it so states that didn't have a lot of population wouldn't have, uh, or would have a say in the presidential election. Now in this case, you can look at it and look at the electoral votes, and in this case, these three states would have dictated over the, the fact that New York had 29, they got 30. Mm -hmm. So, well, let me let me ask you this. So, you know, when I was looking at the, what the people who who support national popular vote on their website and, mm -hmm. and people that I, that I've spoke to, what they say is that this national popular vote gives the individual, no matter where they are in the country, an, an equal vote or, or a bigger say in their vote compared to the system that we that we have right now and, and you showing these graphs you know showing how many more voters there are in certain areas of the country California or or New York uh, and then comparing that to the total number of voters in in middle America or south sure. uh, the northwestern part of America um, you know what would you say to that I mean if you're a voter in in South Dakota doesn't your vote count more equally than to that voter in California um, yes, but no. And the reason I say no is um, South Dakota had, um, in the case of um, the total voters, was 363,000 people. Mm -hmm. um, the voters that uh, California has, I, I believe it's like 13 million people. The, the areas are different. Um, this is an item that the Founding Fathers came up with. They call it factions. And you can have factions with a Democrat or Republican. They're factions. Um, you can have a faction with somebody that's uh, maybe um, pro-life they create. Now they want to get their votes going. Um, anything. It could be a, a race issue in regards to um, a bunch of people in one particular race get together and say, we're going to vote for this candidate. Those are all factions. Um, and that can happen anywhere. It can happen in our state 
um, just you know, and they can even under our current system, and they can still take those votes and and run away with them. Um, the path, the the problem is, if we don't have an electoral college, you can't you can't um, combat factions. And the fact is, uh, and this is a known fact by everybody, New York is a highly democratic state. Um, same with California, and you have other states like Minnesota that. You know, generally democratic, but they can flip flop. You got states, uh, you know, South Dakota, Wyoming, Oklahoma, um, Texas. They're all Republican states, and um, it depends on their size. Mm -hmm. And they all have different. They're they're all different. They're not the same thing. So, mm -hmm. as they have their own electoral votes, um, they represent their state, and that's the whole point. It's not to come in and say now we have you know, in the case of California, three million more votes, we're going to dictate the rest of you people what we want to have you do. In the case of the map, when you look at that and you see 14 other states that have to counter those votes, you're basically, you know, I mean, if you look at that, the, the, the other states that are left on the, the west side of Mississippi, they're all blue except one, Texas. And so they've got a lot of other votes that they can put into play that go back in against on the east side of mm -hmm. the, the United States. So in other words, it's like, it's like going to war with somebody. Are you going to go to war with somebody with 363,000 people and they've got, in the case of California, 13 million people? No, you're not going to. It's not a fair system. And that's why there's an electoral college. It's to give them a little say. Mm -hmm. So it's, it sounds like, mm -hmm. uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it sounds like what the electoral college does is it gives more of a voice to the diverse regions and the different demographics of the country and if you compare it to something a, a, a smaller model you know what pops into my head is is minnesota in minnesota we have a hundred plus house districts and 60 something senate districts and each of those little regions in Minnesota have different interests and mm -hmm. different needs and, and different local issues that, that gets the people motivated to go out and vote for people who they want to represent them. So, and then we have the governor's race or the statewide races, which are decided essentially by a, a popular vote within the state. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. one of the criticisms of, of Minnesota that I've heard is that the Twin Cities or the urban core, the major urban core areas in the state have uh, a higher influence on the outcome of the statewide races, you know, such as the governor and the state attorney and secretary of state. Is, is that similar to uh, kind of what we're dealing with here? Is that areas that have denser populations and in, in higher area, uh, uh, populations in urban areas are going to have a higher influence? Um, yeah, they do, um, but each one of these congressional districts in that case are about the same. So if you're talking about a national race, they're about the same. If you're talking about a, uh, a, a state race, uh, governor, um, you have, and, and it all depends because people seem to congregate with people that have the same thoughts and beliefs they have. I mean, in, in the area of our Congressional District 6 where I'm at, there's a lot of conservative people and there's a lot of Democrats too, but the, the situation there is you seem to get into areas or move to areas that, um, whether it be Minnesota or South Dakota, I mean, if, you, if people don't like it here because of the way um, the Democrats are running the show, they'll move to a state that's a Republican state. I mean, they just go, people go to those states. I mean, people are going into Texas left and right because they don't like what's happening in New York. They don't like what's happening in California. Plus, so there are jobs down there. Too. And they've got jobs. But why do they have jobs? It's because of the way they're running their system. Low taxes, it's, it's a whole less regulation. It's a whole different thing, exactly. So what it boils down to is, um, here's an example. Um, I can pull this up quick because I don't know how long we're... Um, if I can, f uh, here's a couple of things. Mm -hmm. They have, um, on the different congressional districts, um, what I did is I went back in the 2012 um, race or the presidential race and looked at that. In the case of Florida, they had two districts in there. Um, generally, the districts run where if you vote, it's you know 54 to 46, um, maybe 58 to 42. And maybe 60 or whatever. But when you get these things, uh, these districts, and they're 80 plus percent or greater 
for one candidate, um, that's exactly what a faction is. Whether it be, in this case, you know, it might have been an issue where there was, um, you know, a lot of the, I don't know what the population is, so I won't even say it. Um, I'm going to be guessing at it. But in the case of Florida, they had two congressional districts. One was District 20. They had 244,000 people um, that voted in that district. 200,000 people more voted for Obama. Now, in the case, the net vote on that was 156,000. The whole election for the state for the president for the electoral votes was only 73,000 votes. So that one district made a big impact on that election. Um, and this, and they, you can, they can come back and say, well, if we all would have voted, it all would have played into part. Well, not really, because now you just have a bigger picture of that same situation, whether it be New York or New Jersey or anybody that's highly Democrat, they're going to have that same situation because now they're like one entity and they're like a congressional district voting against another congressional district or state. Mm -hmm. And there's, it's, it's not the same. It's not balanced. Mm -hmm. So um, there's another one, too, is, is um, it was, uh, what was that one here? If I find it, uh, Ohio, another one. Um, district 11, one district, 293,000 people, net 228,000 votes. The difference between the two candidates was 166,000 votes. Wow. That was one congressional district. Um, and then Pennsylvania had something similar. Um, they had 460, or out of two congressional districts, they had 461,000 net votes. <coughs> Bless you. And then um, they had 288,000 vote difference between the two candidates. So, you know, people say one congressional district can't make a difference. It can. And if they're going to get the vote out and they're all voting for one candidate, it can make a big difference in a state. Um, but that, won't is, that will not be fixed with national popular vote. That will actually, actually be exacerbated. It will make it a whole lot worse because now, like I said, you're looking at a bigger picture. That whole state, if it's national popular vote, can influence other states. And when you look at the whole voting picture, um, in this case, if you look at it, let's say we let's go, you know, quickly that chart back. Yeah, that map. Mm -hmm. Okay, on that map, you're looking at one state. If, if we just had it set up, get a little water. If we just had it set up that um, those 15 states were going to select the president. Basically, one state selecting the president. And again, that's why there's an electoral college. Um, and you can say, well, that still doesn't balance the system out. But in the whole picture of the thing, with all the other states, it does balance it out. And it doesn't keep those thir or 3, 000, or 3 million extra votes in play where they have to be countered by other states. The other state worries about their own state. They're all sovereign entities. And it's just like you're a sovereign entity. I'm a sovereign entity. We are our own master of our own kingdom, just like that state is. And that state has to represent its people. And if, if it gets to a situation where it's not representing their own people, by going into this national popular vote, in other words, it doesn't matter how you vote. Let's, uh, Oklahoma, the situation in Oklahoma, they just passed in their Senate the national popular vote. Mm -hmm. It's got to go on to the House, and I'm not sure exactly the status of where it's in that. Um, but if they do pass that, that is a state that votes generally Republican. And if they're going to go into that compact and put their electoral votes in there, and let's just say we go back to the 2012 election, and that was a situation where we we're in a national popular vote. In this case, those electoral votes would be put toward President Obama, but everybody in the state that voted for a Republican that would have been the Republican majority and given those votes to the Republican candidate, their votes are basically disenfranchised. I, you know, I don't care if you put it in the big picture or not. The only way the big picture works is if the votes are close enough and the states are close enough, and they aren't. We have four states with almost 20 million or more people, and then you've got a whole bunch of states that are, don't even have a million people. So d just to get this straight then, what this national popular vote is and what the compact is, is, is basically the states saying that we're going to give our electoral votes to whatever the rest of the country says. In the popular vote, correct. And so if the rest of the country votes the majority of this candidate, they automatically get all of those electoral votes. That's so correct. It's not actually proposing to change 
the current system, it's just the way that states delegate their votes. Yeah, but it's kind of an end around, and if you and people don't like that term, but if you also look at it, the circumstance there is the state is supposed to represent the people, and if the state's going to give its electoral votes away before the people really get to say, and that's what they're doing, then you know it's not a or allowing the people to really represent what they want to say in this vote. Mm -hmm. um, with and what this, advantage would this bring for an actual state? For a national popular vote? Mm -hmm. No advantage. There's no advantage. The state isn't going to gain anything by it at all as a state. In fact, the state loses its sovereignty. And people can say that's not the case, but it is the case. You can no longer dictate how you want to have your electoral vote supplied. Mm -hmm. Once you enter that compact, you're in the compact. You can vote as a legislator, as, as far as I remember, out of the compact. But once you're in the compact, and depending on your legislative body, you know you may not be able to ever do that. Which means you've lost the sovereignty, that part of the you know states' rights that is real important. It's it, you, we we lost the state rights and we lost the, the uh, senator vote mm -hmm. back on the on the Seventeenth um, Amendment. Hmm. Dallas, if you could uh, put up the uh, the screen again, um, I just wanted to again put up uh, the supporters of Minnesota politicians that support national popular vote. Um, and you know, you look at this list, again, there's a lot of Republicans on there and there's a lot of Democrats on there. Some of the big names are uh, Tom Emmer supports the national popular vote along with Betty McCollum. Uh, Senator Brandon Peterson, he supports it. Karen Housley, it looks like only two members of the Minnesota Senate Correct. support it. But then there's a laundry list of supporters from the Minnesota State House. Again, Representative Abler, Cornish, Fitzsimmons, Garofalo, Hamilton, Howe, Kelly, uh, Mack, McDonald, McNamara, O'Neill, Sanders, Schumacher, Teese, Torkelson, uh, Uglum, Woodward, Woodard, Zellers, and Zerwas. And, you know, again, Reed, I, I, you know, I want to do more investigation into all of this, but you know, I, I have to uh, wonder, you know, why uh, these legislators, what, what's, what, is, what, are, what is in their frame of mind in terms of, you know, why would they want to uh, cede our rights as a state to delegate our, our electoral votes as how the state voters want to do it? Well, like, I, there's got to be some counter side to this argument as to why they would support it. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I have my theories on some of it. One thing is, A, they don't understand electoral college, like I mentioned before. And um, a couple of my other theories I'm not going to mention right now at this point. They um, probably, I mean, part of it must be, I mean, you know, there's a lot of rhetoric in, in politics, and there must be the, you know, the talk about that this is actually facilitating a higher form of, of democracy or, or democratic process in Minnesota by allowing everyone's vote uh, to count equally throughout the country, but again, still, I, I can't understand why members of the legislature would want to see the the sovereignty of Minnesota and buy into this this national system. Well, it just doesn't make any, I, I any think, sense. Um, the the point is, um, people I think really don't understand. I've talked to a few of the people that don't support it, mm -hmm. and they don't understand electoral college, mm -hmm. um, and a few of the um, the representatives in the Senate and in the House. And when you talk to them. They don't like the idea of national popular vote, but they feel it has to. Ch the electoral college has to change, and I, I believe they just don't understand why it's there. Um, I do know. To me, it seems like uh, the national popular vote, pe vote people. Um, a lot of the different um, things they bring out, the jargon, the theories, the the um, scenarios, they don't use a lot of actual information. If you want to put up. Uh, the Oklahoma, that's the second one. That'd be the second. There Oops. you go. There you go. It, which one? The second one right there. Um, one issue they talk about is even battleground states, and that's what this was to talk about. But the, the fact is, is they don't even keep the same thought in their, their information that they're disseminating uh, together. Uh, if you look at this, um, they talk about battleground states, and with the battleground states of Ohio, Virginia, and Florida, um, the votes or the number that you see on the right side there are the votes that um, basically are uh, cast more for Obama than were for Romney, um, and that was 389,000 votes. So they, they pitched the fact that if we had national popular vote, look what Oklahoma would have done. 
with 480 or 447 votes, they would have won those three states. Well, the, the problem is that's apples and oranges because if you have a national popular vote, now you look at California, three million more people. New York, two million more people. That just totally takes it right out of the picture there. Mm -hmm. So when you start looking at the information and looking at the actual numbers and data, and, and you can use, you can fi fiction, fictionally come up with, and not fictionally, but using the true numbers, come up with different scenarios with different states. You could pick Missouri, and even though Missouri and Oklahoma are two states that are both Republican states, you can just take the difference of the vote and say, how would that affect on the other state? Mm -hmm. And just by doing that, because the state could shift and go Democrat next term. We don't know that. Yeah, and it, which is totally fine. And, you know, it seems to me this, this mm -hmm. keeps recurring to me, but, you know, if we were going to look at reforming the system instead of lumping everybody into the same geographic district of our great country, the United States of America, it seems that a better approach would be to give more influence to the local voter so that the local voter can organize within his local precinct and districts to promote and support candidates and policies that are important to that region. And, you know, I'm wondering if there's any uh, other proposals out there for reform that, you know, you would find are actually more democratic and, sure. and in line with the, the vision of the founders of this country. Yeah, I, I, there's one that's called the Congressional District Method. And it's a method that both Maine and uh, Nebraska use right now. Um, that method is the people in that congressional district will vote for a presidential candidate. Mm -hmm. Whoever wins that district mm -hmm. will get the electoral vote. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, basically then, to, to make this understandable for voters, uh, Minnesota's got how many congressional districts? Eight. There's eight congressional districts in Minnesota. Therefore, we would get eight electoral votes for the president. The fourth district would go to the Democratic one. The fifth district would go to the Democratic one. The sixth district would have went to the Republic one, and so on and so right. forth. And and so it would be determined by the actual local district then? Sure. And, and in fact, let's just take last election in 2012. With the current electoral college or system that we have, um, all 10 votes and the, the other two, what, we'll go back here just one second. You've got eight, but you also have two more votes. So what happens is who, the, the total population in that state, um, the popular vote, whoever wins that popular vote will pick up the other two. Mm. So in, our, in the case here... So it's like our two U.S. Senate and then the eight congressional it, districts. So it's 10 so total, it's 10, correct. Yeah. So that doesn't change. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, for the 2012 election, um, there were six congressional districts in Minnesota that voted for Obama and mm -hmm. two that voted for um, Romney. And so the ratio would have been eight for Obama and two for Romney. And in fact, um, this is one good reason national popular vote people don't want this because they pitch that um, they don't like the idea in going back to the 2000 election when Gore lost with the popular vote and he didn't have enough electoral votes. They don't want to have it set up that a candidate or a, a, a winner of the electoral vote does not have the popular vote. and. The founders knew that was going to happen because it was set up a particular way to be able to give the lower or extra weight to the lower state or the smaller states, with smaller populous states. And in fact, actually, they even put wealth involved there. So it was a circumstance where they tried to match or give them some kind of a weight so it would make it more fair. Um, in the case here on the 2012 election, and here's a really good reason why, and I went back and looked at all the data and the information, but this is a really good reason that the national popular vote people say that this um, congressional district method is making a, a current system of far, far more worse than what we have now. And uh, the reason it is is because Romney would have actually won the 2012 election with 274 congress <coughs> excuse me, congressional districts won and the senators that would go mm -hmm. along with it. And Obama would have only had 264. Mm -hmm. And that's going back and looking at who won those particular congressional districts. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, one positive effect that this could have to go to the congressional system is, is perhaps when they're redrawing the congressional lines every 10 years, 
uh, perhaps there'd be a more honest effort to not gerrymander them to one party or to the other, but to try to make it a more even disbursement of, of people's voting tendencies? Um, it, it'll help, but the thing is, it all depends on the state. In the case of Minnesota, we've got probably three or four really highly Democratic mm -hmm. um, you know, di congressional districts um, or Democrat-controlled congressional districts. Um, really only have, we've got basically really only one strong, a fairly strong congressional district um, for Republicans, and the other two are pretty good, but they can go either way. Mm. Um, I think the good thing about the congressional um, district method <coughs> is the fact that when you're in your congressional district, if you don't like the Electoral College now and the way you're voting, or you vote and you feel, well, oh, that vote's not going to count because the state's all you know, you know, is it more of a Democrat state and it's going to, all our votes are going to go to the president or whoever's the Democrat candidate. Um, and that's fine. But if we've had people that don't go out and vote too, and that's why you need to go out and vote. And so that's another pitch is go out and vote. Um, because I think the last election we had a number of people that didn't go vote and they didn't like either the candidate we were supporting or they didn't like the system or they're getting fed up with the whole thing. Mm -hmm. The good thing about the congressional district method is that's one electoral vote. When you vote, you can really have a say in what goes on in this country. You really can. Um, I like the electoral college the way it is now, but if you're going to improve it, that's the way to go. Because now it brings it right down into the local area, mm -hmm. like you were mentioning, and those people can have a say. And all these districts are about the same population-wise, and there's some variance because of the state's population and size and everything. Um, but if you look at it, um, the person that's in Congressional District 6 can have a say. It's going to make them come out and vote. And if they don't vote, excuse me, then it's, um, you know, then it's their problem. I mean, it's, it's a situation where, you know, people complain about stuff, but they don't participate, don't vote. Mm -hmm. This is one way to get everybody out there and involved. And in the state of Minnesota, I know, has generally always the highest, you know, turnout for voting. Um, this would probably even increase it even more. In fact, it would increase it throughout the country they'd have more people going out to vote. Hmm. Because now they're going to have a say. And even if it's one electoral vote, that might be number 269 to 270, and mm -hmm. you might get that vote and be able to do that and, and elect the president. So hmm. it makes a big difference. Well, Reed, we're almost uh, out of time here, but uh, you know, I wanted to give just the last like 30 seconds or a mm -hmm. couple minute or two for you to just to, you know, tell the audience uh, anything else that it is that you wanted to tell. Um, I uh, Honestly, in, in my opinion, um, I think... Uh, a couple of things. First of all, before I forget, um, there at the bottom there right below my name is a website and if you contact me within a couple of weeks, I'm going to have packets that will be available. It's going to have a lot of this information, a lot of the data that I've pulled up and collected. And it's a circumstance where you'll be able to look at that and make your own mind up and decide, you know, come up with your own scenario. Pick Minnesota and, and see how Minnesota is affected with other states that have um, you know, uh, you know, like the case of New York, they have seven million more voters, or seven million voters. We have like three million voters. How will we aff be affected by their votes? Um, and just pretend. Don't say it's your Democrat state and it's not. We're going to go along with them. Take it as a scenario that you're going to vote for candidate A. They're voting for candidate B. What kind of say are you going to have in the system? Mm -hmm. Again, it's like going to battle with with somebody that has. You know, uh, Minnesota, 3 million voters. California, 13. That's four times the people mm -hmm. that, that uh, are voting. Yeah. So it's a circumstance that uh, anybody in their right mind wouldn't go to war that way. Now, that might not be the greatest rationale, but if you look at the Electoral College, it's kind of the purpose. It's to kind of, um, when, when the factions are involved, it's a circumstance, circumstance that the factions are kind of being um, not nullified, but muffled a little bit because a state of Minnesota, when they elect their electoral votes, aren't affected by what happens in New Mexico or New Mexico or New York or Ohio. In the case of the, the Florida and Ohio that I mentioned, um, those, those circumstances, whether it was, we know there was some voter fraud in Ohio, whether it was voter fraud that did that or whatever, we know there's voter fraud that came out recently in, in an area out around North Carolina. That didn't seem to affect the North Carolina votes. Of course, we don't know when they call voter fraud, they don't really say who they're voting for, so we don't know that. Um, but the circumstances, it's, it's held to that state. If they come up with 
a million extra voters in the state of New York or California, that won't affect Minnesota if it's electoral college. If it's not an electoral college, that one extra million people are going to affect Minnesota and every other state in the union. Mm -hmm. And that's basically the whole point. I think it's real serious that um, people need to really look at this. And uh, I think I think this um, is a circumstance that it'll help destroy the union if it does. I mean, it'll basically destroy some some other states' rights. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think as a union. Together, we have to stay together. And I'm not saying the other pitch they always use, too, is, well, nobody wants to make a change. Well, you know, if you look at the facts and the information, this works. And basically, the complaint was um, the winner of the Electoral College has not won the popular vote in so many times. Well, we've had 57 presidential elections. That's only happened four times. One of them happened in 1824, I believe the year was. And the circumstance there, they had five people running for president. They split all the votes. I think it was uh, Andrew Jackson had the um, populist vote, and, but he didn't have the number of votes needed to win the Electoral College. It ended up going into the House, and they have a special procedure for that. And so the House and the Senate you know, did their thing to, to find out who's going to be president. So the other three times, um, Two of them were, one of them was in 1888, the other one was in 1876. Um, who knows what happened? I mean, I don't know. Uh, it could have been because we're still back in horse and buggy days back there. It might have been where communication wasn't, wasn't good enough or people decided not to vote. Who knows? I don't know. Um, the last one was 2000 when Al Gore lost um, the electoral vote. So. It doesn't happen that much. It's only 7% of the time. Odds are it's not going to happen for another maybe 10 elections, maybe 12 elections. We don't know. Um, one thing they'll be fighting, though, is this congressional district me method because that congressional district method, I know the Republicans have come out and kind of started pitching that, um, which actually is a more fair system. But the problem with that for a liberal Democrat progressive mind is um, just looking at, the, like I said, the last election, Romney would have won, which means their candidate wouldn't have won. Mm -hmm. So why do they want to do that? And they can go back and do that with any, um, yeah. any of the elections that are in, in play. Well, the way that I think of it from a purely statistical and numerical analysis of it is, is you know, imagine your pool, your voting pool that you're a part of, or if you even think of it as like a physical pool. Mm -hmm. uh, the bigger the pool is, as an individual, the, the less of a splash you can make in that pool. You know, you jump in the ocean versus jumping in a pond. Uh, you know, you're going to make a bigger, bigger splash in a smaller pool of people that you're voting because you have more influence there. That's right. And the, the thing is, that's also a good analogy because it also brings back the Electoral College. That's the purpose. When the small states, they're not going to have a big splash. In the case of uh, South Dakota, 363,000 voters, um, and you have 13 million in California. They're not going to have a big splash, and they still might not get that big of a splash with the Electoral College. But they're going to have three electoral votes. Percentage-wise, because of the number of people they have voting, may give them a little more uh, in the system in regards to a little more play. In fact, they were talking about because the state, the small states have a larger um, proportion of these electoral votes in regards to getting the two senators into each of the states because they're all supposed to be equal. That's one of their pitches, too. But the thing is, the Electoral College was made to protect the small states and the citizens of those small states so you don't have other larger states with their population basically dictating who's going to be the president. Mm. And um, let's say Texas goes, uh, goes blue in the next three elections. It could. And if it does, now you've got Texas, Oklahoma, New York, uh, not Oklahoma, Texas, California, New York, and Florida. And Florida is another one that's kind of iffy because you get people retiring down there. But it's a circumstance that those are the four largest population states. And they can dictate every election you know, from here on. And if a state goes more Democrat or more Republican, that's how the people are going to vote. So it's going to have that much more play into it. So. Mm -hmm. Well, great. Reed, I uh, appreciate you coming on the show and uh, teaching everybody about this. And I hope you can come on in, in a couple weeks where we're going to have an important debate on mm -hmm. national popular vote. And we have some proponents from national popular vote just so the audience here that's watching the show can get a, a full spectrum 
of both sides of the argument. And uh, thank you very much for uh, coming on the show. Yep. Appreciate that. And Dallas, if you can just uh, pop out this the screen that we're looking at here now. I uh, just want to again go over the names of our Minnesota representatives, both federal and, and state, that are supporting National Popular Vote. And if you're unsure about this issue or if you have questions about it, I urge you to contact your local uh, legislator, your state representative, state senator, uh, ask them where they stand on the issue and ask them why. You know, challenge them and, and go out there and educate yourself more about the Electoral College, National Popular Vote, and some of the voting reforms that are going on there. And again, I encourage you to uh, contact your legislators. Uh, we have a list of people here that are supporting it. Looks like some pretty big names like uh, Tom Emmer, who's running for the U.S. Congress in, in District 6. Uh, Congresswoman Betty McCollum in the 4th Congressional District. Uh, her and Emmer are, are joining teams there and supporting this. Uh, and then on the House side, uh, Jim Abler, Cornish, Fitzsimmons, Garofalo, Hamilton, Howe, Kelly, Kresha, Mack, McDonald, McNamara, O'Neill, Sanders, Schumacher, Teese, Torkelson, Uglum, Woodard, Zellers, and Zerwas, uh, and then there's a number of Democratic uh, legislators that are supporting it as well. Um, I urge you to go out there and contact them and, and find out why it is that they stand for this and uh, see, you know, they can justify it and explain it and go out there and educate yourself on the issue because it's a, a very, very important issue. Uh, so with that, I'm just going to uh, switch gears here a little bit. There was a, a lot of news that was made recently about the uh, Bundy standoff, and, and this actually didn't get played uh, too much. So Cliveland Bundy, uh, uh, he's a cattle rancher out in Nevada, and uh, this gives some of the backdrop, but he had a standoff with the Federal Land, and Bu Land Bureau Management, and uh, we're going to watch this now. is now moving forward toward the barrier. The police have been telling everybody they are going to shoot if we don't move back. People are moving forward with their hands in the air, holding flags with both hands in the air. It's a mixture of people on foot, as you can see, people on foot and cowboys. With Metro, all right, push these people back up off the gate, push them back up off the gate, we're going to work to release these cattle, listen to me, I'm going to work with you, I'm going to work with you, but I need you to back up. I understand that what you're doing, and you will get that time. Okay, right? Right. 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 I know, I get that. We're going to push them back up off the gate for right now.
big guns, aren't you? Oh, you're so tough. You're so brave. Look at that. You got a bunch of bullets. So, yeah, that was the scene out of uh, Nevada last week with the standoff between the Clive and Bundy people, uh, local Nevada residents, and uh, the Federal uh, Bureau of Land Management. And it was just an issue, you know, that I don't want to get into exactly about the legalities of it. We could spend a whole show on that. But I wanted to show everybody because I believe that this is uh, something that you're going to see happen more and more and more as people become more disenfranchised and feel uh, misrepresented or not represented at all by the federal government. And as the federal government continues to grow in its scope in terms of uh, ownership uh, of land and legislation and ownership of markets, such as uh, healthcare, banking, and, and other markets, you're going to see more and more people uh, confronting the government and this was actually a very dangerous uh, standoff at one point there were hundreds and hundreds of people who were supporting uh, Clive and Bundy on horseback most of them were unarmed I guess a few of them did have uh, concealed weapons but the vast majority of them were unarmed and the Federal Bureau of Land Management they actually have their own SWAT team uh, and they had their guns pointed out uh, pointing at the people and uh, because there were uh, women and children and many unarmed uh, people in this group, uh, the Federal Bureau stood down. Uh, they didn't shoot, but you know, one has to think or contemplate at how close this was to uh, some type of a, a violent conflict between the federal government and the people. And you, know, you don't have to go so far back in our recent history to find examples of uh, federal government officials using violent force against unarmed civilians and uh, resulting in death and, and destruction. So something to keep in mind and it's something also that our elected officials should keep in mind because there is a diverse group of people out here in America. You can't lump everybody into one constituency or one demographic or one ideology and that's the danger that we have with uh, the top-down authoritarian form of government that we are uh, that we have right now and, and that's growing in its scope is that they are implementing one size fits all policies on everybody with little regard to uh, local interests or little regard to the values of uh, the diverse American people but we are coming to the end of our show now and I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in again we broadcast live every Saturday from 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock in SCC Television Studios right here in White Bear Lake. We also broadcast live in SPNN and uh, other channels. Our YouTube channel is Tony Hernandez Show. Uh, please go there, share our shows, put it on your Facebook, put it on your Twitter. Uh, thank you for tuning in. May God bless you. May God bless America. And bye con Dios.